so for those who don't know me, I am a current ASF board member. I'm also the VP of the Apache Incubator, and I've been doing, doing both of those roles for, for a number of years now. Um, recently, about six months ago, I actually joined InstaCluster, which you just saw in one of the keynotes about what services they provide. Um, and there I'm actually the VP of training services. I also worked on um, the incubator PMC for, for a number of years, coming up to about 10 now, I believe. Uh, I'm the mentor of several other ASF projects um, and I'm involved in, in a few others as, as well. And I've reviewed uh, hundreds of releases at the ASF. It's probably up to um, a thousand. I may have actually done more than a thousand releases. I'm not a hundred percent sure as I've, I've lost count <laughs> of, of that, you know, some time ago. Uh, for the people who've just joined us, if you do have any questions, please just ask as uh, we go along. There's only a few of us in here, so this is pretty you know, informal and you know, like a little bit friendly and more chat-like. So what is the Apache Incubator? Now, I assume everyone here does know what the Apache Incubator is, but just in case you don't know, it is the main entry point for new projects into the ASF. It's not the only way that a project can come into the Apache ecosystem, but, but it is the main one. And I'd say 90, 95% of projects come into the ASF through this way. And it's basically where you get to learn about what we call the Apache way and learn how to become an Apache project and how to make releases in the, the, the way you're doing. And in this talk, I'm focusing on how to make a release. So I'm going to skim over some of the other important things that you need to know. But some of these will be covered in other talks in this incubator track and also in the comdev track and in other, other, other talks as well. So what we try to do is we want to try and take an existing community and make them understand about how Apache projects work and, and the way that they operate and make sure that they follow what we've come up with as the best guidelines to how you can make open source software. Um, and we we don't claim that we're the you know this is the one true way of making open source software. There are other ways that work as well, but we think over the twenty years that we've been in existence that we've come up with you know, a set of guidelines that that really help you make you create software for the public good and to build the community around that. Just give me a second here. Ah, here we go. So, yeah, why, so why do we actually have an incubating process? You know, why can't you just suddenly join as a top-level project if you've already got a community around you? Um, and there's a number of reasons for this. And the, the, the main one is to actually ensure that the code that we, we have coming in from these projects can comply with the Apache 2.0 license. So a big part of incubation is to, to working out the licensing of all your code and to work out, you know, whether whether it can actually be released under the Apache license. And for some projects, this is really easy and straightforward. You know, if you've written all the code yourself, then, you know, you don't need to, to look at licensing a third-party code or look at IP provenance, where code came from and so forth. And that makes it a lot simple. But for most projects, you know, there's a little more complexity in there uh, and, and some more than most. We also want to try and make the project follow the ASF structure that, that most projects follow, uh, and that is having uh, contributors, committers, and PMC members. And that you grant more responsibility to people who actually show up and take part in the community. And this may mean, you know, by submitting pull requests and actually writing code, uh, but it can be a lots of lots of other things as well. It can, it can be writing tests, it can be providing documentations, 
It can be organizing community events. You know, we, we want to make sure that you, you recognize more than just code. We also, it being open source software, decision making and is done in the open and transparency, transparency, sorry, is really important. And most importantly at all at the Apache Software Foundation is that we want people to act as individuals and not the company that they work for. So they need to do what's best for the project. And that may be sometimes at odds with, with you know, the company they work for, and that can cause a little conflict in, in some projects and some more than most. So in general, we want to have podlings learn and a podling is just a, a project that is going through the incubation process we want to have them to learn and follow what we loosely call the, the the apache way so what is this apache way so it covers a number of things and it actually means different things to different people and there are different interpretations of it and depending on who you ask you may actually get different answers and, and that can be confusing, but that's actually a good thing because it means that we let projects self-govern and projects operate how they want to be and let them find their own way to fit in with this. So there's no real hard rules that you must do things this way. Um, there are some policies where, you, you know, there are things that need to be done in a certain way, but even those are not written in stone in that you can, for if you have a good reason, do something some other way. Now, there's going to be other talks about the Apache way in the, the ComDev track. Um, so I'm not going to go into a, a, a big detail about it. And hopefully, if you are an incubating project, then your mentors will be helping you with this and being describing it to you. And if you're a mentor on a project, you should already know this. So, so you know, that should be self-evidence at, at this point. But there's some main concepts under the Apache way, and um, I'll just go through a couple of them here very briefly. And the first one is charity. And that, that is that the Apache Software Foundation creates software for the public good. So the software that we create should cost nothing for people. They should be able to freely download it, install it, ask questions about it. We're there to help them. The users are the most important people in your community. We're also pragmatic, so our license is business friendly. Anyone can take our software and use it for commercial uses. We don't have any restrictions on how it can be used. Um, and sometimes that brings up some concerns. Uh, you know, not everyone uses software for, for, for good. Um, but we think that's the best way that the software can get adopted. We're also about community over code um, and, and about growing the community around this bit of software. And that includes collaboration with other people in the community, finding consensus on how to go forward uh, when there's any issues or decisions to be made. And we also need a diverse community on a project. And, and that diversity can be along many axes. It's not just the typical meaning of diversity. Gen generally, the, the, the one that we're mostly looking for is that no one single company has control of a project. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, later and i've also got another talk at the end of the day when i go into a lot more detail um, about some of the problems that incubating projects can, can can run into where i'll discuss that in more detail um again everything must be open and consensus open and transparent so everything needs to be in the public view there can't be any discussions occurring off list they need to happen asynchronously in a in a way that anyone can search and be involved with and that anyone can participate. You don't have to be working for a company full time to be able to be involved in a project. And most of all, you need to form consensus about working out ways of working together and finding the best way to move together as a, as a community.
Again, if you have any questions, please uh, just ask them in the chat there, and I'll, I'll certainly do my best to try and answer them. So currently, uh, we have 37 projects in the incubator. Um, this uh, has fallen in recent years. We did at one point have slightly over 50, uh, about three or four years ago. Um, but that was probably a little too much to handle. And I think uh, the, the, the mentors that we had with the projects were spread a little thin during that period of time. We have 241 incubator PMC members. Not all of these people are active. Uh, some of them are sporadically active and, and help out where they can. Uh, some are active all the time. Some of them, um, you know, maybe should retire from the incubator PMC. But uh, as long as they're still there on that list and, and, and it, there's a good possibility that maybe some point in the future that they'll help out and that's a good thing. To go through the incubating process, it generally takes about two years. Some projects do it in less time. You know, a few projects have done it in under a year. Uh, some projects take a lot longer. Some have taken four or five years to be able to do that. There's, um, I say there's about a dozen or so successful releases a month. Um, it's probably a little less than that. I think at the moment it's around about the 10 mark. Um, but the good news is that about 90% of releases uh, pass. Um, a few years ago, that wasn't the case. And a lot of releases would be rejected by the incubator. Uh, but these days, we've put a, a few processes in place. And we're you know possibly a little more lenient. Uh, so we can help projects actually get their releases out. So the thing about making a release is that we're talking about source releases. So it has to contain source code and not compiled code. So if your release contains a jar or a DLL or an AXI, most likely that's not going to pass. Like jars are just compressed files, and in some cases they don't contain compiled code. Um, so you know, there's a few edge cases like that. But in general, um, a source release has to contain source and can't contain compiled code. They've got to be cryptographically signed. Uh, incubating projects must contain a disclaimer. And there's two different disclaimers, and I'll go into a little detail about those. They have to have an ASF license and notice file. Uh, I just got a question from Claude here. Um, Yep, he's saying he's always worked with the rule that you, you can have off, an off-list discussion, but you have to document it on list. And that's that's entirely correct. Um, so it, it's OK to have conversations off list, but you need to make decisions on list. And that's the most important thing. And you need to involve the entire community in those decisions. So if you have a conversation off list and, and, and make a decision and then bring that to the list and say, this is how we're going to do things, that's really not on. You know, you need to involve the whole community in in reaching consensus on that decision and what you're going to do. Thanks for the comment, Claude. So just going back to what I've got on the slides here, the um, so you need to have that license notice file, and you have to follow licensing terms of any third party software that you include in your release. And this is really important. And this is one of the issues where you know, a lot of projects have some issues. So, um, and finally, the, the the source files in the release have to have ASF headers. Where, when they were files that were created created at the ASF or created, you know, as part of the the the, the project. So I mentioned before that there were two disclaimers. Um, so there was the, the standard disclaimer, which basically says this is an incubating project and it may have some issues. Um, but you still got to get things right with that disclaimer. So what we've done to make things a little easier for incubating projects is have a work in progress disclaimer. And with this type of disclaimer, you can say that, OK, well, we're, we're working towards complying with ASF policy, but we're not quite there yet. 
And these are the things that, you know, may not quite be correct. So, for example, you may have GPL software included in a release. Now, GPL software is regarded as category X in terms of licensing, and that can't be in a source release. But with the work in progress disclaimer, you can say, well, we know this is an issue. We're trying to fix it, and we will fix it. But for the moment, just bear with us, and we'll, 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 we'll get there. So all of these issues that are listed in the work and process disclaimer need to be fixed before graduation. Um, but it, this enables podlings to be able to um, create releases on a more rapid fashion, particularly when they come into the incubator and particularly for podlings that have a lot of issues to sort out. You know, it may take them some time to get there and it, it would just be unfair on them if they couldn't make releases for you know six months or a year or longer while I tried to try to sort out these issues. So when you create a release, you will create a release candidate. Um, and there's generally a release manager who's involved in, in doing that. And then you'll put that release candidate up for vote on your dev list. Um, and once you get three plus one votes and more plus ones than minus ones, you will then ask for a vote on the incubator list. Now, notice there that it's three plus one votes and more plus ones than minus ones. It, a minus one is not a veto. And the whole idea behind this is that you want to make releases frequently. And it doesn't matter if they're not perfect. What matters is they should they should be better than what you the previous lease you've made, but as long as you can keep complete iterating and improving and making new releases, then that's a good thing. Um, if you go six months or a year or three years or four years without making a release, then that's probably a bad thing. You know, you want to keep making these incremental releases and getting them out there so the community can use them and test them and give you feedback on them. So once you've voted on the release on your dev list, then the incubator votes on it. And to become an official release, it actually needs three plus one votes by incubator PMC members. And again, a minus one there isn't a veto, um, but you need at least three plus ones and more plus ones than minus ones. Generally, this process um, in each case where you're voting on the dev list and on the incubator list, last 72 hours. But do note that this 72 hours is just a guideline. Um, and if there is a pressing reason that you need to do something quicker, for example, there's a security issue that needs to be urgently fixed, then it can happen in less time. But the whole concept behind that 72 hours is to allow people who don't work full time on the project, or who are involved in other time zones, or you know, have other responsibilities and only work on the project part-time to be involved in the release process. So say you put your, your, your release up to vote and the incubator knocks it back. Someone has given a minus one vote. Now remember that minus one vote is not a veto, but it probably should still be taken seriously. And these are the most common reasons from uh, hundreds as I said, if not close to a thousand releases that I've been involved in, why they might get a minus one. Quite often, a source release can contain binary code. So it's got a, a jar or a DL or something in there that shouldn't be in there. Uh, licensing is, a, a, is another big issue, and we'll talk about that in a little more detail. But the source release could contain something that, that shouldn't be involved in the short release. And that's what we refer to as category X license code. And that's something generally like, um, you know, GPL uh, or a few other licenses along those lines as well. Um, there's also what's called category B. And these um, licenses that are, that are not permissive licenses, but they're not copy left licenses, and they sort of fit in between. And in general, we don't allow those in a source release as well. They are allowed in a binary 
release, but not in a source one. Um, there are often issues with license for notice, notice files. Uh, and again, I'll go into a little more detail about that uh, in uh, uh, five minutes or so. Um, copyright issues. If you included something in, in the release that you, know, you didn't have permission to include and you didn't have permission to distribute. Um, that happens reasonably frequently, but we're starting to get down towards the, you know, the, the, the least frequent things. Um, missing license headers or having header issues. Generally, if a release, you know, has a few files that has a problem, that's that's not a big issue. So here we're talking about if you've got hundreds of files that are missing headers, or there, there's something that you know has badly gone wrong. And the last thing is. Um, with encryption software. So encryption software has to be treated uh, with care and um, there are certain regulations that the US government needs you to comply with and, and we need to follow those. Uh, so, um, you know, you need to make sure that is all in order. Um, unfortunately, these regulations are very complex um, and are, are certainly very hard to understand um, and have changed in recent years too. So the the policy that we currently have and the advice that we have around that is a little bit out of date, and and hopefully that will be updated soon. So just want to iterate that you know that the release doesn't have to be perfect. Um, you're not expected to get it right the first time. As an incubating project who've just come into the ASF, you may not be familiar with the policy. Um, and the, the policies that we have, which, as I said before, are more guidelines, they don't cover all situations. It may be that, you know, the certain position that you find yourself in is not one we've encountered before. Um, or there may be, you know, some differences between your project and another project that it doesn't apply. So. You know, uh, often it takes a bit of discussion to try and sort these situations out. Um, and projects are allowed to do things in different ways. Um, you know, it, different projects have different rules and different guidelines, and uh, some of them will follow one set quite strongly and others will be a bit more flexible. So it does depend a lot on the community in the project and 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 how that works as well. Um, but the best thing to aim for is that make sure that there's no surprises in that release. So when the uh, the incubator looks at it, or the incubator PMC looks at it, um, you know they're going to give you a plus one vote. Um, and as I was saying before, you know there's this these what often as we see as policy and rules are more guidelines. There isn't actually a single right answer. Um, the documentation we have is can be confusing and it can sometimes be out of date. There's sometimes it's not documented well, and sometimes there's a, a shared understanding in the incubator about what is policy and what you know what is the right way to do things, but it's not clearly documented, and 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 that can cause you know some issues. Uh, I totally understand that. We try to keep the documentation up to date. Uh, but you know, it's not sometimes it's not always possible, and there is a lot of differing opinions on on you know what is the, the right answer. Sometimes, if you ask different people, you you may get different advice. And it doesn't mean that you know one person's wrong or the other one isn't. It it just means that sometimes it's hard to come up with a you know the right answer that fits in within the Apache way. Um, so. I think my, my advice here is that if there are multiple ways to try and solve a problem, like just be cautious. Don't try and do something that you know no other project has done before. Don't try and think that your project is special and that the rules don't apply. Um, even though they don't have to apply, it, it's it's like it's a lot more work to go down that path. It is possible. But just, you know, try to err on the side of caution. And often you'll find that the changes that you need to make to your project or code or licensing or whatever it is is, is actually quite minimal. 
So licensing is is definitely where one of the issues that occur, and a lot of projects run into this. It's complex. Um, you know, a lot of developers don't understand licensing to any great depth. They might have a some understanding of it, but you know, the it can be quite complex. Um, there can certainly be a language barrier to, to, to people who don't speak English as their first language. Uh, licenses are, are hard to understand even for those who, who do understand, who do speak English as their first language. Um, and the other thing is that the ASF policy has changed over time. So there's a, a few things that, you know, we used to do that were possibly fine, but now are not. And you, you have to be a little bit careful about that. So there, there are certainly, for instance, some cases where a, a podling will copy what a top-level project is doing, but that top-level project may be doing that for reasons the podling doesn't understand, or it may be that the top-level project hasn't kept up with policy and what they're doing actually, you know, is a little bit out of date and, and then they need to change the way that they're operating as well. And, and the podling may not actually realise that. The other thing is that the ASF has some policies which put some obligations on top of what is legal. Um, so the licenses is just the you know the legal obligations that you need to to deal with and comply with. Um, but our policy adds a little bit more, and and we in particular around the license and notice files, we ask that you list all licenses in the license file, even if it's not required by the license. We also ask that you have to have a notice file. Um, the Apache license doesn't require you to have a notice file. It just says that you know if one exists, it, it needs to do this. And we also want clarity around IP. Um, so we want projects that respect third-party licenses and headers and not change headers on files. Um, even if you take a file from a, a, a third-party project and, and it's a compatible license, say MS, MIT or BSD, and you make lots of changes to it, those changes really, really have to be significant before you change the header on that file to an AS of one. And even before you do that, you should probably ask the original owner of the file, is it okay to change that header? Um, so, you know, you just need to take a little more care here than you would maybe normally. So the guiding principle behind creating a license and notice file is that they need to represent what is in the contents of the release. So this is not what you've got in GitHub. This is not what is in, say, your binary release. This is not the dependencies that your source release may depend on. It's what's actually inside it. Um, and that actually makes it a, a lot simpler than a, than a lot of people think. Uh, um, some projects get a little confused about the dependency thing, and they start list, listing licenses of dependencies in the license file. That's not required. You only need to mention stuff that's included in the release. And this also applies to both source and binary artifacts. Um, so if you make a convenience binary artifact alongside with your source release, it may be that it has a, dis a different license and notice file. So when you're creating a release, you need to check to see what it contains. So in particular, you'll, you want to look for things that are not permissive licenses. So you want to look for things that are not licensed to MIT or BSD. Um, but have some other license because they, in general, can't occur in a source release. Um, there's a few other things that you want to look out for. Uh, photos uh, that you may not have permission to distribute and fonts are two areas that, that are generally troublesome. Uh, um, and there's been a, a number of releases that ended up getting, you know, minus one votes because, because of that. Um, the other thing is that where source code has been copied and pasted from. So, for example, you can't take source code from Stack Overflow 
and copy it into Apache project because the licensing isn't compatible with the Apache project, sadly. Um, and quite often you, you can find this out by having a look at, uh, you know, it might mention a hyperlink that says this was copied from Stack Overflow, blah, 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 blah. Um, so that that is one thing to look out for. Now, a lot of these things, and some projects try to automate this a lot, and automation will definitely get you, uh, will help you, but it will nev never, ever replace manual inspection. Um, human eyes are almost always going to find something that automation will miss. Uh, so it's always a good thing to just double check that, even if you have some automated process in place. So we have Apache Rat. This is a great tool for, for finding out whether your source releases you know, comply with ASF policy. It's not perfect, um, but it does a lot of the job for you. And as, as I said, some automation is good, and, and this is some automation. Um, there's a few things that it won't find. It's not going to find headers that mistakenly have ASF and, say, MIT or BSD licenses stuck on the top of them. Um, it doesn't know about all licenses. Um, and a, a, what a lot of projects do is they put in some rat exclusions to say, oh, this, this directory is fine. You don't need to check any of the licensing here. Um, and often those exclusions can be too wide and miss something. Um, so it's always a good idea to, to, to run rat without those exclusions and see if it picks up anything. You know, just to do a casual inspection, pass your eyes over it and see if there's something that, that stares out, uh, you know, as obviously incorrect. So one good way of, of finding licenses, I, I just use a simple tools and command line to, to check releases. Um, I tend to use grep and find a lot. Um, so I just like search through random text strings and see what I can find. So if you search for GPL, or BSD or MIT, you know, chances are you're going to find something um, that may refer to a license. Um, GPL, yeah, uh, MIT is a fairly common phrase, unfortunately, so that you get less success with that. Uh, the other thing you can search for is the word copyright um, and and sort it uniquely and pipe that out and, and you know, see what's in there. And that'll often pick up copyright statements in header files and, and things like that. The other thing you can do, particularly with complex releases, is you can say search for all the copyrights in there and you, you might get, you know, a thousand results. And it's like, oh, I'm not going to manually check that. So let's look at the previous release, do the same there. And then compare them and see what's changed. And for example, if you suddenly have all these new copyright license uh, notices appearing, but that copyright license notice isn't mentioned in the license file, then there's probably an issue. So that can be you know, a nice little shortcut to, to, to work out by comparing releases, what has changed between them, um, and you know, give you an indication of what, how license for the notice file may should have changed. Um, I have voted minus one on releases for containing cat photos. I think it has occurred four times now. Um, it's sad, but <laughs> it's like you can't take a random image off the internet, put it in your release, and distribute it unless you know the licensing of that image. And quite often, you're not going to have permission to do that. If you ask for permission, you can really get, you can usually easily get it. You know, someone's, if you say to someone, hey, look, I'd love to use this photo in this release, um, is it okay to do so? Generally, the answer is going to be yes. Uh, you know, people like to see their work being used and they're happy to contribute to open source. But in some cases, you know, they may ask for a license fee or the license may not be compatible with the Apache license. So you, you, you can't do that. Uh, we had a, a theme for the slides for this conference. The license for that theme, unfortunately, is not compatible with the Apache license. Um, so that's, you know, brings up some interesting issues about it. But, you know, in most cases, that's not going to come in, be put into a source release. So it's, it's not a big issue. So um, if you have a look at all the images in your release, 
you know, pick out ones that look professional and think, oh, I'm not sure where that came from. You can use, you can look at the image metadata for those images, or you can use Google reverse, reverse image search. And they have one ways of finding out where this image may have originally come from. So all releases need to contain a license file. I've, I've already mentioned this be, before, and that needs to list all of the licenses that are bundled, bundled inside the dist distribution. Again, your source and binary file may have different license and notice files because they have different contents. Um, what, if you've got a lot of licenses, one good way of dealing with that is actually just pointing to another file within your license file, saying here is the full text of the license in, say, slash licenses, slash whatever. Uh, and, and that gives a good overview of anyone who's looking at the license file to, to know the terms. Um, because, you know, all BSD licenses are pretty similar. You, you don't need to read the full text every time. Uh, and so that can be helpful as well to the, the, the users of your releases. As well as a, um, a license file, oops, I'm clicking the wrong thing there. Um, you need a notice file. Uh, and um, that just generally contains an ASF copyright and a develop the ASF notice. It has a year that you need to keep up to date. And there's a few things that get added to the notice file as well. Um, and there's only a few things that need to be added in. Generally, people try to put too much in a notice file. Uh, license information doesn't belong in a in a license file. It needs to go and go in the license file, not the notice file. So there's relocated copyright notices. So they're generally things from software grants that have had their headers replaced. The, if you bundle other content from ASF projects, then you need to look at those notice files and include the content from those notice files in your notice as well. And there's, the, there's these things called other required notices, but they generally never, ever come up. There's only a few cases that they would. And generally, in those cases, the licenses are not compatible with Apache licenses anyway. So it, it, it doesn't really matter. So there's a, a, a number of categories uh, that you can put licenses in. And these are called Category A. Category B and Category X. And I'm just going to briefly skim over these. Uh, basically, Category A is anything that you can bundle in a software release, and they don't have any restrictions above and beyond what the Apache software license has. Uh, and these are licenses like um, the Apache license, obviously, uh, the BSD license, the MIT license. So they're the most common ones that, that you'll come across. The category B license does place some restrictions. Um, and this means that you generally can't include them in a source release, but you can include them in a binary release. Common ones for these are the CDDL license, the Eclipse license, EPL, the Mozilla license, and most of the Creative Commons licenses as well. It may come as a sort of surprise that the Creative Commons licenses are not category A, but that they're, they're not. And then there, there are licenses that you can't depend on and you can't include in your software. Uh, there are some exceptions where they can be used for build tools and optional dependencies, um, but they're fairly limited. And the most common one for these uh, is GPL, LGPL, non-commercial licenses, and any license that adds, you know, um, um, a field of use restriction or something along those lines. You, you, you can't use any of those. So as I was saying before, you can't have unexpected binary files in a release, so no compiled source code. No executables, no DLLs, no jars, no class files. Um, minified JS is also sometimes considered as compiled, so it's best to only include that with the original source code uh, as well. As I mentioned before, all files that have been developed at the ASF should have an ASF header. 
the ASF header is different to the third party ASF header and doesn't include a, a copyright line. So just make sure you use the correct one. Occasionally, some projects use the incorrect one and put a copyright line in there where, where it's not required. And finally, the, you know, the last thing that we can check for when we're making um, a release is that you can compile it from code. And it helps here to, you know, make sure that um, it, that's easy to do. Provide instructions. That's that's the easiest thing to do. Make it easy to compile and, and provide instructions. Uh, if you need any other third-party components to to you know just compile, note that in your instructions as well. Uh, this can make make reviewing releases so much easier. And if you make it easier for for re releases to be reviewed, then people are more inclined to do it. So there's a few common mistakes. I've mentioned some of these before. Um, unexpected binary files in the source release is generally the most common one. Contents of the license and notice files. Missing headers. Uh, missing disclaimer occasionally happens, but that's it's fairly rare. And releases not being put in, in the actual um, right place occasionally happens as well. It's less common these days than it, than, than it, than it used to be. So binary distributions are not considered official releases, but you can make a binary dis distribution from a source release, but it still needs to comply with ASF policies. So as I've mentioned a few times, the license and notice may be different. So just be aware of that, that you may need to put a little more work into working out what goes into the license and notice for your binary release, as well as your source release. Because your binary release often has uh, dependencies included in the release, it often means that there's a lot more things that need to be added to license and notice. Seeing how we're going for time, and I think we're running out of time here. So uh, just ending up, um, ask for help. So if you need help with this, it is complex, and you're not always going to know it straight away if you're you know, a new project. So ask on your mailing list. Ask your mentors, more importantly. If your mentors are not available or can't help you, ask on the incubator mailing list. Um, and if it's a legal issue, something to do with licensing or so forth, ask on the legal discuss list. So there are the four places that you can go to get help. Um, and we are here to help. Like if something is unclear or you, you don't understand something, um, please come to the, the mailing list at the incubator, the general mailing list, and ask questions, we're happy to help and we're happy to update documentation um, and make things you know clearer for projects where it's needed. So do we have any questions? I think we've actually run out of time, maybe, <laughs> just about. I think uh, the, the next session start in, in four minutes, so I can probably answer one or two questions before you have to run off to that if there are any. I'm just going back to the questions here. How do you assure project compliance after passing incubation? Um, that's not an incubator issue. That is a board issue. And generally, the board will notice if you're not complying with some of these policies. Uh, someone says here that there's the documents, that there's a lot of documentation and it's not always consistent. Yeah, that's. Sadly, that's a fact of life. Um, we, in recent years, we had tried to make it more so, and there has been a trend towards less documentation. And, um, but yeah, you can still run into problems there. If if there's any confusion, just ask on the on the list to get clarity. That's that's the best advice I can give you. And Chris says that the the there's a cool slides. Slides framework. These slides were generated by the Apache training project framework. And yep, it's really cool. So I think that's it from me. And next up, we're going to have Christopher Dutz, and he's going to be talking about a how to start a project up 
in the incubator and you know what his experience was like in going from proposing a project all the way through to graduation. So join us in, I think, five minutes for that. Have I got that right, Chris?